trajectory of education packages children as standardised units ready to serve at the altar of the, of the economy. And for children, this doesn't make any sense. And this not making sense is an outcome of viewing education as an efficient measure of instruction, where children are considered as weak, where children are considered as without yet having any ideas, rather than viewing children as vibrant and rich with ideas of their own worth sharing. And this is, this is my nephew, Archie, born just a few weeks ago. And when I held him in my arms for that first time, and I looked at him, I wondered what would be his story of education? What would be his pathway of education? What was the trajectory that he might find himself on? And my question for us all here today, and what I want us to think about, is what might be the consequences of valuing the genuine curiosity and inquiry of young children? And the one thing I can guarantee us all today is that we were once all children. And this is me, aged four, and we saw somebody else earlier as a baby. Um, and at four, I already knew that I had a strong passion for drawing and painting. And this is one of the paintings here that I had done at the kitchen table, as many children do. With my mum, she'd roll back the tablecloth and would allow me to draw and allow me to paint. And when I started school, that very first day, the first thing I was given was a tin. And on that tin was my name. And then we were given a pack of 12 crayons. Well, I was a happy girl because I knew all about drawing and I knew all about painting. But I learned something about drawing in my early days at school. And this is one of my pictures here, one that my mum saved. And I apologise now for the fold in the middle of this, which kind of ruins the slide a little bit. But she hadn't got the foresight 37 years ago to know that I'd need this picture today for TEDx. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but I wanted to share this one um, because it's fairly typical of the kinds of things that I see in our schools now. So you can see here we have a picture of a girl, a girl with spiky hair, strange colour. <laughs> and we know it's a girl because the teacher has kindly written a girl underneath it. And you can see here, we have some puddles as well, because it has been labelled as so. And maybe she asked me that, that question, you know, what is your drawing about, Deborah? Which is kind of rude, actually. It's a rude question to ask of children. But I'm interested in this girl and who she might be and the ideas that sit behind that. Another image here. A little bit later on in that first school year. And although I think this is a great picture of a crocodile, I drew it. <laughs> the most important thing on this piece of paper is not the drawing. And draw, remember, drawing for me was the, I saw it as a language. A language that enabled me to express my ideas, sometimes where words were too complicated to use, or sometimes where words were too painful. But here on the page, what is, port what is important here <coughs> is that sentence, this is a crocodile. And in fact, what is the most important thing on here is that capital T and the full stop at the end of that sentence. And so I learned at school, I learned from school that drawing and painting had another meaning. It wasn't the same that I felt. And I believe that if we can recognise the passion of children, recognise their passions, then children will remain motivated and school will make sense for them again. This is Jake and Jensen, two brothers who live in Warwickshire. And they recently moved house. And one of the things that they did 
upon moving to their new house was to set about finding out who else lived there. And they have found quite a diverse population of garden snails. And their curiosity has drawn them to look for this. I, I think curiosity is something that is born inside of children. We don't have to teach them that. Loris Malaguzzi of the schools in Reggio Emilia talks about children as having a hundred languages. And he speaks about children who have a hundred languages and a hundred, hundred more. And school steals 99 of those. This is Myra, and she's also, she's four years old. And we've got her drawing here. And she goes to school in Singapore. And I was lucky to be part of um, some work the teachers were doing there. And we were sat, one of the days, we were sat around the table discussing what we might do the following year, a project that the children might want to be involved with. And one of the children joined us at the table, and his teacher asked, well, what do you think? It was a great question. What would you like to know more about? And he just looked at us and said, the world all of it. <coughs> and that's what they're doing right now in their school. And they're not teaching the children about the world. They're interested in knowing what the children can think about the world. They want to know what the children know. So I've got a little bit of audio here. It's spoken by another child. It's not spoken by, by Myra. But let's just listen to what Myra has got to say about the world. I was thinking that if there were no flowers in the world, then it won't look nice. If there were no plants in the world, we wouldn't have any food. And if there were no people, then the world wouldn't be. Wow, the world wouldn't be, spoken by a four-year-old. And we can see in her, in her description there that she sees the world as a place of interdependence, a world that is a place of relationships. Here's another example of somebody at the same school, also aged four, Mia. And this is quite an incredible drawing because in this drawing, she is, she is showing us her hypothesis about something very big, a huge idea. Let's listen to what Mia says about her drawing. I was thinking about all the planets and the way they turn round. Four years old. Four years old. I find these quite incredible examples. And they're not special examples. These are just examples of what's possible when we listen to children. And here is a group of children collaborating. We spoke about that this morning. It's a shared inquiry. And this is Paula, the school administrator. And she's been shown here a very complex composition of children's thinking. And it's a complex idea, but done in simple materials, the stuff of a typical nursery classroom. And they're based just down the road, Maidley in Telford. Yet these children are able to think about the internet, electronic communication, and cloud technology. And this is their representation of what that means, of what that looks like here, of where messages go. And it began not by happen chance, but because there was a teacher there who was willing to listen to the ideas of children. And they went into the school office and they closed their eyes and they listened to what they could hear. And the children were interested in the sounds of the persons in that space. And when Lou, the teacher, offered back to them their ideas about the sounds of the person, she realised what they were talking about was the click, click, click of the keyboards. And when the children, when she gave the children some keyboards, they talked about it in terms of the keyboards make our fingers dance. We have computer fingers. Now, she could have turned that into quite a dull lesson. She could have turned that into something that was about them learning to write their name or typing a message or sending it to someone, but she wanted to stay true to their thinking. 
and she'd offered them some paper, again, to extend and evolve their ideas and to draw what happens when their fingers danced on the keys. And you can see in this drawing the importance of the hand, the hand that is open, the hand that is wide, and how these messages are circling through the air. And we have Victoria's comment here about the internet and how it goes to a person. It doesn't just go to another computer. The messages go to the person. They go inside of you. And this is the stuff. This is the language of children. So here, again, offered some clay this time. And the children formed hands out of the clay. And they put the clay against the keyboards. And they talked about different kinds of messages and where messages went. And some of them would say that messages go down the road. They get in a car and they travel. Others talked about wires underground and how the messages go that way. Your fingers start dancing and then the messages move. And somebody else said, no, 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 no. They don't go in a car. They go in something called Google. <laughs> and so let us imagine if, if our children are capable of things like this, if our children, our youngest children, are capable of thinking of things like astrophysics, then what are we doing in school? We need to reimagine what is possible. And I want us to imagine what would it be like if every school developed their classrooms and their grounds as environments of inquiry where the teacher is focused on listening and acting upon the children's natural, innate curiosities. And where these curiosities become the basis for the curriculum itself. Because I think by valuing children's inquiries and curiosities, we can revitalise education by reconnecting with the thinking child who is already capable of ideas worth sharing. <laughs>